Okay. Well, first of all, hello everyone. Um, hello students, teachers, whoever is watching at this very moment. Thanks for being online here. Welcome to my living room. So many of you may not know me. My name is Sabine Kinsland. I have been teaching anthropology as a creative activity at your college for the last three years. So for this year's sustainability fair, I have been preparing this workshop on digital anthropology. Actually, it was thought um, as a project that I, you know, carry out with, uh, together with my students, but it was hard to prepare it um, from a distance. So um, I would just go through some of the most interesting things by myself. Well, actually, now that I think of it, um, it's not such a bad idea to give a talk on digital anthropology online. It's quite fitting, isn't it? Um, obviously, I wish the reasons for this were very different ones. I hope all of you are fine in good health and safe, um, also your family and friends from wherever you may be watching at this very moment. So, as I have been preparing the original workshop, I was amazed by the multitude of articles and questions in online forums about this apparent loss of humanity due to technology. So many questions came up that regarded, um, or that asked, have we lost our humanity to technology, right? So one um, former Google designer, he warned, Facebook and smartphones are an existential threat to our humanity. Other questions would be things like, um, how can we stay humans in the online world? Um, or other things like, is the digital world really a threat to our humanity? So if you type into Google, just these four words, lost humanity to technology, you get a good 1 billion entries. But the interesting thing is that it seems like there is a counter narrative going on as well. And as much as people um, think that um, we may lose humanity to technology, so are they also conv convinced that actually technology may save humanity. So if you look up, or if you type in these three words into Google, technology save humanity, you get a good 95 million entries. I wonder how people think about these questions these days as we all are confined to our homes, to our spaces inside um, and cannot really socialize with anyone else except with people online and our you know, smallest family. I wouldn't be talking to you right now if it were not for technology. You wouldn't be doing your online lessons on Zoom or children wouldn't connect with their friends on Minecraft or on Fortnite. No one would socialize on online platforms. I have talked to the teacher of one of my children the other day. She, she lives alone, by her, all by herself, and she has been confined to her house um, due to uh, a contact with a person who had the coronavirus for two weeks. She was not allowed at all to leave her house. And she said, actually, what has saved me were my Facebook friends, as they sent me messages of hope and support. And I felt connected to a community that was larger than just my nuclear family. So it's been really a very positive experience. Well, fact is that digital technology concerns much of humanity. And much of humanity has thoughts on it, whatever those may be. Well, you may wonder, and in particular those who are not familiar with anthropology, what does anthropology have to do with the digital world? Isn't anthropology the study of far and distant people and, you know, the anthropologist hanging out with those people and trying to learn and possibly to understand languages and trying to understand those people's worldview? Yeah, clearly, this is anthropology, absolutely, but it's only one part of anthropology, right? I think Clifford Geert, he's a very renowned was a very renowned anthropologist. He once said, he said it very tellingly actually, he said, imagine you could have lived a thousand lives, but you ended up living only one. Anthropology tries to make you understand how some of these other 999 lives um, could have looked like, that you could have lived. Um, Anthropology, though, is not just storytelling. Anthropology goes deep and at times can become almost philosophical. It tries to tackle questions such as personhood, identity, 
the self, society, and yes, culture. Well, in simple terms, I think um, it really tries to understand what it is to be human and how we, how we can be human in so many different and ever-changing ways. So as the digital world is clearly having an impact on our way of being human, it has become a natural subject for anthropologists just to be studied. But clearly there are a few questions to be answered. First of all, how do you define digital anthropology? And how would you study the digital world as an anthropologist? Is participant observation the signature method of anthropologists a good and valid way to understand um, online worlds? And if so, how would you use that method in order to study digital um, technology? Well, participant observation, as the name itself says, makes of the researcher participant and an observer in the social situation that you try to understand. So that means in case you try to understand the life of sex, sex workers in London, you would um, go live with them as closely as possible. You would follow them around. Um, you would try to become all their friends, you know, understand as much as possible um, about their worldview. And then you would take your field notes, write very meticulous um, and detailed field notes that eventually would be the material from which you would produce an ethnography, which is a written descriptive account of your research, or you would turn it into a theoretical article and contribute um, to building theory in anthropology. So can you do this when you study the digital world? These are all very good questions. But let's start from the definition. Daniel Miller, who he is a professor at the University College London, he is at this moment, I think, one of the mo most prominent researchers um, of digital worlds as, as an anthropologist. He says, digital anthropology can, can be used to refer to the consequences of the rise of um, digital technology um, for various population groups or the use of that technology in anthropology as a method or the study of such, um, such technologies um, themselves, okay? He defines digital anthropology or the digital as anything that can be reduced to binary coding of zero and one. Other anthropologists may study on cybernetic systems or circular systems or on separate online worlds like Second Life, for example. So in that sense, anthropologists, they study as much hackers as the life of gamers, um, people's behavior on YouTube, social networking sites, WhatsApp, people's reactions to artificial intelligence. Actually, I have been reading a very interesting article about um, how, di um, how um, artificial intelligence, um, how people react to artificial intelligence in different places around the world. And it's a study that has been commissioned by Intel. So um, but particular technology companies, they have their own groups of anthropologists that they um, send out to study people's behavior with, uh, with technology and in particular to understand how people use their products and um, how they could produce products that could be more appropriate for, for their clients in the future. So I'm sure that after this quarantine, we will be able to find a multitude of articles about analysis about how people have been using social media during the times of quarantine. So watch out for it. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting stuff. But why would I talk about digital anthropology at a fair that deals with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals? Well, goal number 16 states that our aim should be to significantly increase access to information and communications technology and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in least developed countries by 2020. So in the workshop, I had planned to look in particular at what the consequences have been of the rise of online media on various populations. And in particular, um, I plan to look at how social media has been giving voice to persons with disabilities who are oftentimes confined to the houses and who have otherwise no easy way to connect with other people. Does that sound familiar to you in these days? Just think about 
all the people who always are confined to the houses or, or for whom it's not very easy to leave the places without making major arrangements. For us, it's a quarantine and we know that eventually it will end, but um, persons with disabilities, they have a hard time always, you know, leaving the houses if they are, um, if they are, if they are impaired. And these people actually, they have been organizing and creating community online for a very long time. So today I would like to introduce you to the story of Amanda Bucks. Amanda is now in her early 40s. She was 27 years old when she decided to share with the entire world the way she sees um, and, thinks, um, and thinks about her life as a person with autism. So she registered a more or less eight minute video of herself in her flat, she edited it and uploaded it to YouTube. So this happened in 2007. In 2007, YouTube was not even two years old and it had already surpassed the screening time of ABC's three network stations. Today, people upload 500 hours of video onto YouTube every single minute. The charm of YouTube um, as compared to formal media is indeed its informality. So people from all walks of life, all ages, um, can upload videos onto YouTube at all times of the day and about all kinds of different topics. People can leave comments underneath, which makes it interactive and creates a kind of community. So I would like to show you now um, the video that she has created back then. Um, it's called In My Language. And I will try to share now my... Um, computer screen with you, one second.
The previous part of this video was in my native language. Many people have assumed that when I talk about this being my language, that means that each part of the video must have a particular symbolic message within it designed for the human mind to interpret. But my language is not about designing words or even visual symbols for people to interpret. It is about being in a constant conversation with every aspect of my environment, connecting physically to all parts of my surroundings. In this part of the video, the water doesn't symbolize anything. I am just interacting with the water as the water interacts with me. Far from being purposeless, the way that I move is in a going response to what is around me. Ironically, the way that I move when responding to everything around me is described as being in a world of my own, whereas if I interact with a much more limited set of responses and only react to a much more limited part of my surroundings, people claim that I am opening up to true interaction with the world. They judge my existence, awareness, and personhood on which of a tiny and limited part of the world I appear to be reacting to. The way that or I think and respond to things looks and feels so different from standard concepts or even visualization that some people do not consider it thought at all, but it is a way of thinking in its own right. is seen as so natural that people like me are officially described as mysterious and puzzling rather than anyone admitting that it is themselves who are confused, not autistic people or other cognitively disabled people who are inherently confusing. We are even viewed as non-communicative if we don't speak the standard language, but other people are not considered non-communicative if they are so oblivious to our own languages as to believe they don't exist. In the end, I want you to know that this has not been intended as a voyeuristic Greek show where you get to look at the bizarre workings of the autistic mind. It is meant as a strong statement on the existence and value of many different kinds of thinking and interaction in a world where how close you can appear to a specific one of them determines whether you are seen as a real person or an adult, or an intelligent person, and in a world in which those determine whether you have any right, there are people being tortured, people dying, because they are considered not persons, because their kind of thought is so unusual as to not be considered thought at all. Only when the many shapes of personhood are recognized will justice and human rights be possible. That's quite a strong statement that Amanda made, right? There is much in this video one could talk about. Actually, I think we could make an entire workshop just on that. From an anthropological point of view, it's very interesting how Amanda puts the topic of personhood right on the table. If I don't speak a language that you recognize, it means I'm a non-thinking being, a non-person. Why is it always seen as a failure if I don't speak your language, but it's never seen as a deficit if you don't speak, um, if you don't understand the way I communicate? Can what are everyone, you doing? Can everyone hear me? You're investing in oil. Got a few more barrels at home. I guess I need to. You, know, you don't have to buy the actual second. barrels. Maximize your trading power with C. Okay, that was not planned. So we're back now. <laughs> Sorry for this. Um, so she says, why is it seen as a failure if I don't speak your language, but it's never seen as a deficit if you do not understand my way of communicating? So Amanda's very powerful video went viral very quickly. 
And um, her claim for autism to be seen as a legitimate way of being triggered CNN and the New York Times and also a couple of other media outlets to write a series of articles about that condition. Also in 2010, President Obama included um, the first person with autism in his National Council of Dis on Disability. So as Faye Ginsburg, an American anthropologist, states it correctly, in my language makes it very clear how interactive digital technologies can serve as powerful and often unanticipated platforms for persons with disabilities to communicate with the larger public. It allows them to engage in discussions about their own world um, in the first person, affirming hands an alternative sense of personhood without the need for anyone there to interpret it for them or to intermediate. She says, look at me rather than don't stare. This is supposed to be a strong statement on my way of perceiving the world. So online platforms such as you know, YouTube, but also other forms of social media, they really have enhanced the ability of persons um, who either fear direct um, face-to-face -face communication um, or who cannot leave their homes um, due to their disability to create community. And actually, she said back in 2006, there is a lot of us where we might not be able to meet anywhere else but online. I guess her words ring particularly true in, in this very moment. And here you can see the very powerful effect of social media. All right. I have been talking um, quite a bit here on the positive effect of social media um, on persons with disabilities or how persons with disabilities have been, used, have been able to use social media in a very positive way. But we must not forget that all the while that we are serving, on, serving the internet, all the while we are active on social media, there are um, tech companies in the background that collect data on us, massive amounts of data, that um, gets sold to third party companies that then allows those companies to predict our future actions. Um, I'm just mentioning Cambridge Analytica. I'm sure it tells you something. Shoshana Zuboff, she's a professor from Harvard. She calls this um, surveillance capitalism, how certain companies become ultra rich by selling data generated through surveillance and which has the capacity to predict our actions. This is not the topic of today's talk, but I want to mention this because I want you to keep this in the back of your heads. Today, I'm concerned about how people use social media. Um, but as I said, it, it's important for me to, men to mention it. So actually, when researchers, and in particular anthropologists, when they talk about social media, what they really refer to is the content that people post on those social media platforms rather, the, rather than the technical platform itself. And this can be Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, YouTube, um, Instagram, however they may be called. So why do people think, post the things they do? Why do they mm, communicate through these platforms in the way they do? And what are the consequences of such postings? Just think for a moment about yourself. What are the things that you usually post on Facebook, Instagram, MySpace, whatever, you know, whatever kind of social media platform you may be using? So what is it that you usually post? What are the photos that you post or the visuals that you post what are the things that you would never post and why not, right? There is a logic to it. So the heart of the study of the social sciences is trying to understand how people communicate and how they relate to each other, how they form relationships and yes, um, how they form society. So one way of looking at it then is to really flip the question and ask, how have we changed social media rather than how has social media changed our humanity. So a research team at the University College London, and I have already mentioned Daniel Miller, but actually there is an entire team working on that at, um, at the UCL. They set out to understand how people use social media all around the world. And so under the header, why we post, they sent out nine researchers to eight different countries around the world, trying to understand what people do on social media and how they use it. Um, so these countries included China, Peru, Brazil, Trinidad, um, Turkey, and so forth. 
they published a series of books on it and also in, in, in different languages. And you can find them all online. They are all for free download. So it's, it's called Why We Post, University College London. It's really very, very interesting. And as I said, it's all for free. So just in a nutshell, what came out of this two years study is, as you can already imagine, that people use social media very differently in different places. So they found, for example, how women in Southern Italy would repudiate their premarital ways of posting in order to appear as more conservative wives and mothers. While in Trinidad, it would be actually the contrary. Um, women tried to appear very sexy even after they got married so that they continue um, you know, to be cool and fun um, even after motherhood and, and, and after marriage. So social media here, it really, helps us understand um, how gender stereotypes are portrayed and visualized on on, online, um, many times also with vis visual associations such as, for example, beer for men or wine for, wom for women or care work for women and manual work for men. So other examples of, um, or under other interesting findings um, that they have mentioned in their series of books would be um, that you cannot really talk about the selfie um, as if it were the same thing all over the world. So they found, for example, um, in their field site in England that people distinguish three groups of selfies. So one would be um, the classical selfie. The other one is the groupie, so where people post in groups. And then there is the ugly, where people try to, you know, post in a particular ugly position. In Chile, on the other hand, um, they found out that people love to take footies meaning pictures of their feet, like here, for example, in front of the TV. Um, in Brazil, on the other hand, in their field site in Brazil, they found out um, that people love to post in gyms, um, as this is indicative for belonging to the middle classes and um, people who aspire you know, to move upward, they like to take um, selfies in the gym. Another interesting find is related to education. So while in certain cases, um, social media is seen as something that distracts from formal education, in other places, it is actually considered to be education. And this happens in particular in low-income environments where people otherwise have no access to higher education. They consider that um, you know, being able to watch online lectures on YouTube and so forth actually does help them get ahead um, with their education. So as you can see, it's quite different in different places. These are just a couple of examples. Um, others will pertain to the area of you know, politics, inequality, individualism, and so forth. So I really invite you to have a look at it. Um, and as I said, you can download all these books um, for free or just, you know, just browse through them. It's, it's, really, an interesting, it's really interesting stuff. All right. Um, so when research of the internet started out, people oftentimes, they talked about the online world versus the real world, right? So um, researchers say there is actually no such distinction as the online and the real world. Social media and um, technology is so much embedded in our everyday lives that we really can think about it as being a separate entity. Um, or whatever we do in the offline world is the real thing. And at the moment we connect ourselves to the computer, we are no longer in the real world. That's not how it really works. Also consider, for example, um, whatever people do online may have very real consequences in their offline world. So for example, you play games online and lose money. This has very clear consequences in your everyday life. So it's almost like talking about the phone conversation that is taking place in a world that would not be the real one because you're using technology. So um, researchers continue to say there is no such distinction as the online and the real. You cannot make um, these divisions. So rather than classifying actions into real and unreal, what social media has helped us do is to understand the mediated nature of any form of communication. So the mediated nature of communication. I'm going to explain this in a second. So it really this really brings us back to one of the 
So an important discussion in anthropology on positionality and situatedness. Um, what does it mean? It's Donna Haraway who talks in particular about this. She's a very um, renowned and famous anthropologist. She says, we all carry with us a backpack full of filters through which we perceive the world and any kind of communication that we have. So how we interpret particular situations, particular conversations, particular a particular kind of communication depends on those filters. And those may be upbringing, schooling, education, religion, gender, and so forth. So any form of communication is perceived through those filters, no matter if that conversation takes place through a device or not. The thing is that if that conversation takes place through a device, these filters are more visible than if you, if you talk to, to a person, um, if you have a person right in front of you. But in reality, these filters are there always. So what researchers propose us to, or, you know, what they have developed that should help us understand our relationship with social media is through a theory of attainment. A theory of attainment. So what they mean by this is that via, that, um, via communication, through, the tech, uh, through new technologies, through digital technologies, we acquire or attain a new set of capacities, such as those required to drive a car or to use a cell phone or a smartphone or whatever. So they really oppose the idea that through the advent of new technology, we have lost some essential element of being human or we have become post-human. Our way of being human changes as it has always all throughout the existence of humanity. So just think back to the times of Socrates and Plato, more or less 2,500 years ago when uh, coherent writing just started to become ubiquitous. This was long before the advent of cell phones, of digital technology, computers, and so on. At that moment, writing was that technology of the day. And it was so new because it allowed people um, to communicate in a way that transcended time and space. Actually, Socrates, he was very, very suspicious of that new technology. And he said, and I'm quoting him here, I cannot believe that anything certain or clear could come from what was written down. He was particularly suspicious of how people could interpret his writing or his text without him being there for clarification. So luckily, his student Plato, he was, he was more open to this technological change by clearly recognizing the shortcomings of writing, but he would also understand the advantages of it. And, um, if it were not for his openness, today we wouldn't know anything of Socrates because it's Plato who wrote down Socrates' thoughts, right? Um, Jordan Shapiro, who writes about how to raise children in the digital age, actually, it's that book, obviously, is an informed mom, uh, I have read it. Um, he, he said, Plato, if he lived today, most likely he would be a video gamer, I think. Um, well, we know today that writing hasn't caused evil to society, quite on the contrary. It's changed the way people communicated and the way people created society. And I'm absolutely convinced that there will be a moment in time when we will think back to the advent of digital technology just in the very same way. It changes our way of being human. In this historic moment when so much of humanity is confined to inside places, is not able to socialize in person outside, I don't think we would even want to imagine a life without um, being able to connect on computers um, and talk to our friends on smartphones and see them through um, video technology. Well, thank you so much um, for having listened to this talk. Um, hope all of you um, are in good health and fine wherever you are and hope to see and meet you all in person, um, hopefully sooner than later and stay safe. And yes, absolutely. If there are any questions, then I'm still available for um, some time. Please go ahead. Um, can I ask something? Um, can you hear? Yes, um, I cannot see a face though. Who is, who is asking? Um, if you I could. Can you hear? Yeah, I can hear you. If you can just um, tell me your name. 
Uh, yeah, so I am Latra. Mm-hmm. I'm from Kosovo. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wanted to ask if we think of uh, communication through on uh, through media or social media, whatever it is, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, uh, or any other social media, do you think that uh, nowadays um, communication is more straightforward and easier and there is communication is deeper in terms of like for psychologically and emotionally do you think communication is deeper through social media and if so do you think that's a disadvantage today or do you think it's just a consequence of uh, technology but not necessarily a bad thing well i can i can i can respond to you with my own opinion as i don't know any studies of that um or at least i haven't read them i don't know i think so many times there's the argument that um, communication on social media or through social media is quite superficial right um that's also the, the other fear that a lot of people have but i think i also think that many things um it depends on who communicates also it depends on the person who communicates but um there are things that you wouldn't that are more difficult to say probably if you are um present in person sometimes things are better said through writing um but then as i said it also depends on the person who communicates if the person is um more reflective or not if it has if that person has deeper thoughts or not um so I, I really don't think that you can generalize or that you can automatically say any communication through social media is necessarily um, superficial, just as you cannot say any commu- you know, communication via through social media made communi- uh, conversations more deep or deeper. Um, I, I really don't think that you can generalize across the entire spectrum. And I personally think that it, it also depends on the person I don't know if this has satisfied your question. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Can can I say something to Latra? Yeah. 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 Danny, as a psychologist, um, and especially now with this issue that we we are all in the same pot of the digital uh, support, we uh, there is lots going on there there are lots of information lots of resources lots of communication and uh, we we can very easily um experience um that lots of resources are available when it comes to mental health and psychological support there are lots of resources available still research shows that on the one hand um, the, the g- digitalization of these resources have helped or are helping many people to be more aware of what is available in the field. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to uh, a proper support and the proper, um, uh, the proper therapy, for example, psychological therapy, then uh, the building up of a relationship is extremely important. That is really the major step that makes a huge difference between, uh, um, so it really depends a lot on, uh, um, on, there are many variables that unfortunately uh, we need to take into consideration. There is for sure a certainty that the digital world has helped um, the globalization of the knowledge of mental health, surely. Yeah? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think Lyra has a question. Uh, yeah. Um, so, hi, I'm Dira from Kosovo too. Um, I wanted uh, to know your opinion about, like, uh, the question is, with the, will the cultures of individuals from societies that have great access to uh, and control of communication media overpower those in cultures that have fewer resources? Mm-hmm. Overpower in what way? Like, for instance, we know that uh, uh, in some part of the world, there are people who barely know that um, uh, information technology exists because of their uh, 
uh, of their resources that they have. So um, would you think that there could be a possibility in the world to be in, um, how to say, um, e equalization? So basically, you are asking if those people who have no access to information technology, if they are at the, at the disadvantage, right? Is that your question? Yes. Yeah, well, exactly. yeah I, I think so. And this is also why the EU United Nations, state, one of those sustainability goals is the one to bring online, um, well, online technology to all the countries in the world. So clearly, I think they are at the disadvantage because, I mean, the online world with um, in spite of um, what Shoshana and Zuvov says, you know, that there is a lot of surveillance in, in the internet. Um, I think still there are so many advantages and you can find so much information on the internet and you can do so many things that um, if you don't have that access, clearly you are at a disadvantage. And this is actually why the UN's sustain, why they are really making that a focus to bring online um, technology to, to everyone, right? That's... Um, I can I can show it to, to you again. This is you know, the United the Sustainability Goal number sixteen. I'm reading it here again. Is to significantly increase access to information and communications technology and strive to provide universal and affordable access to the internet in the least developed countries by 2020. And that is particularly this is for that reason that um, clearly you are at an advantage if you have more access, if you have access um, to the to to the internet absolutely yeah Hello, Thank you, hey, Mustafa. i'm sorry uh, we think that the sort of the shift um, to the digital world sort of transforms the, like the conversation about objectivity in anthropology in the sense that like for example oh. as, as says that there is always uh, like a uh, bias or a uh, partial perspective and if you sort of come point while we reach a objective uh, reality sort of but then within the surveillance capital like the idea of surveillance people don't really see uh, Mustafa, being... I'm sorry to interrupt you but I can barely hear you I can hear you very interruptedly so <laughs> um, I really cannot understand your question Okay, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> you want to try again with, I, I don't know, or well, there is a way to write it. Why does Namaya say her question? Then Mustafa, you type it in the chat. You can type, oh, yeah. But you want to turn Namaya if you ask yours. Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me because my mom is dry cleaning, but I'm Namaya from Switzerland and I wanted to ask you um, the kind of filters you talked about, like every um, form of communication is perceived through it. Do you think it prevents us from seeing, or do you think it creates a certain kind of bias? And do you think this kind of bias is dangerous? It, like when we, yeah. Well, um, so in anthropology, there has been much written on this bias. And actually, all my yeah. students, um, they have read um, Donna Haraway and they need to read her. Mm -hmm. And you cannot, um, you cannot prevent anyone from having a bias. So mm -hmm. it is okay. absolutely normal. We all have biases. We cannot have, we cannot not have a bias yeah. because we grow up in a particular environment. We get a particular education. We grow up in a particular family. Um, we are members of a particular religion or not. Um, all this creates a particular, a particular way of seeing the world. So what uh, Donna Haraway in particular suggests is since you cannot, you just cannot erase um, all these experiences that then form your particular world. What you can do is to be aware of them, right? Is to be aware of them. And when you look at things, you may remember, oh, maybe I'm, I'm interpreting a particular situation in this way or that way, because this is my filter. Yeah. You cannot eliminate your filter, but you can be aware of it. And mm -hmm. then the moment you're aware of it, you can step out a little bit um, of you know, of um, the way you see things and at least reflect about it. And, um, and, and yes, and, and maybe that will help you to being able to see it, you know, a little bit from another perspective. Okay. Thank I you. don't know if that makes sense. No, yeah, it does a lot. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Mm, I also have a question. Good afternoon. I'm Beatrice from Italy. Um, okay. Um, recently, we are witnessing um, 
the uploading of a huge amount of info of data on, on the internet due to coronavirus pandemic because we are kind of transferring many of our activities mm -hmm. online so do you think that um this fact would uh, increase our um feeling of of uncertainty and also would make us feel more vulnerable in our relationships the uploading of a lot of data to the internet you mean yes because we are transferring many of our activities also due to this quarantine online so i'm very concerned about of the amount of data that we are uploading on in the internet these days um well honestly i'm i'm not exact I'm not exactly sure where you're uploading it to and the way the platforms work that you're using. I'm, I don't, I'm not informed enough about this, um, but I'm sure that your school, um, you know, uses platforms that are safe and makes sure that um, uh, this is not, this is not going to be used, you know, uh, or that, that doesn't end up in, in hands where it should not end up. I don't, um, um, not only an academic platform, I'm talking are you, are you talking about your private um, communication with friends, you mean? Not only communication with friends, for example, um, instead of going um, shopping physically, uh -huh. we are we tend okay. to do more shop online shopping these days. So we are, uh, in, in general, we are uploading more data than usually. Yeah. Com yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to tell you. Quarantine. I'm going to tell you a story now, and that story actually has been told. It's not um, has been told by Shoshana Zuboff. Um, Susanna Zuboff is is the Harvard professor I was talking about. So listen to this. Um, there is a couple. The girl, um, she all of a sudden she switched from using her regular shampoo to using a perfume neutral shampoo, okay? Google has interpreted this as that girl needs to be pregnant because pregnant women are very sensitive to smells. Indeed, she was pregnant. From the moment on, they started bombing her partner with ads about baby equipment up to the point that the father of the future child all of a sudden went um, to his, his wife, his, his partner, and said, are you by chance pregnant? I'm getting all these, you know, ads for baby equipment. How can that be? So Google knew before the, father, the baby's father that, you know, his wife was pregnant. And they knew this only because she changed the shampoo she would normally use. So obviously all the data you know that you provide the internet with or that you put up on the internet um is accessible in one way or the other and this is what shoshana zuboff calls surveillance capitalism clearly it's accessible you must you must be um you must be aware that the data that you put in um you know is is accessible to many more companies and people that you may even think of. So she, she gave also the example of someone who was buying a thermometer, a room thermometer. And actually, if you wanted to read all the contracts um, and if you wanted to be absolutely informed about all the consent that you give when you buy this thermometer, you would have to read 6,000 pages. 6,000 pages just by installing a room thermometer. Of, of course, a thermometer that would be connected to the internet so you can check your temperature from far. So it, it's not, um, it's a digital device, right? But um, if you, as an informed consumer, would read all, all the things that you give consent to, you would have to read 6,000 pages. Who does that? No one. But that's the way things work, you know, through that, they get all your data right so um i'm sure that all of us you know if we use the internet if we buy things online we give away data without being aware of it and without being conscious of it and this is what is so, so particular about this surveillance capitalism she says it escapes our consciousness it escapes our knowledge it's all subtle and behind you know behind the scenes 
and you really cannot be aware of it. And this is also why she campaigns a lot for regulating um, the way data can be used online, regulating the internet. But at this, at this very moment in time, you know, the data that um, you put up onto the internet when you buy things, you know, I'm sure that um, a lot of more people use that data than you can only think of. Thank does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So you think that eventually this would lead us to a, um, a greater feeling of uncertainty and would make us feel more vulnerable also in our relationships. So for, for example, the mother uh, who was pregnant in her relationship with uh, the father of the baby, like mm, her um, husband, um, she probably felt uh, yeah, more, more vulnerable and also, um, yeah, so. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. But I think that's been going on all the time, not just maybe now during current time that people buy more things online because that's the only place where you can really shop for things that is not food, right? Um, but this is why she has been campaigning for years to regulate the internet. Thank you. Yeah, because it makes us more vulnerable, absolutely. Yeah. Linked to that and also what Nemea was talking about earlier, so you sent our class um, a video which said uh, in it that also Facebook at one point had offered um, the Indian government to provide free mobile internet to all citizens as long as every citizen also installed the Facebook app. And this could also be packaged behind um, uh, sort of ideas about social justice. But actually, the, the reason why Facebook is a free platform is that it can sell uh, user data to so many third party companies and it makes mm -hmm. its money from that. So it, who do you think has to be the agent which brings technology to um, every citizen of the world? So we're talking about earlier about the UN SDG. Who is it who has to bring uh, mm -hmm. technology to everyone? Is it the tech company like Facebook? Um, or does it have to be other companies with less or other, mm -hmm. other institutions, other agents with less um, mercenary motives with less interest you mean yeah well i think in the end it's it's gonna be if you think about it in practical terms it's gonna be one of you know um the internet companies in cooperation with governments that's how it's going to be in practice because otherwise how are you going to do it you know um that's also how it how it has been you know in the past um like how how they provided um um, internet um, in 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 countries um, in non-Western countries, let's say. I re I remember there was um, a big discussion about Facebook who wanted to enter the Indian market, and they haven't been very successful. So actually, um, I think India chose to work rather with Google directly than with Facebook. So I think it's in the end, it's also going to be who 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 offers the better package. But um, I totally agree with Shoshana Zuboff when she says the internet needs to be regulated. And it's clearly not okay, you know, that um, uh, so much data is being collected on us that we are surveilled without even being aware of it. And then other companies um, really making huge money on, on this data because based on that data, our actions can be mm, predicted, right? But it's... It's really interesting how they do it. It's, uh, for example, they would, you post a photo on Facebook, right? And they would collect thousands and millions of photos and just look at the way um, your face looks like when you're happy, you know, um, or how it looks like when you're sad. And uh, this data can be useful in creating, um, digital technology of face recognition. So maybe our photos are being used in the development of facial recognition that may be used by dictatorships to surveil the population, you know, to police the population. So we have no control over the way our data is being used. Isn't that happening in China already? Yeah. Yeah. For example. <laughs>
I mean, it's also happening in your iPhone when you use facial recognition to sign into a password or something like that. Um, yeah, it's everywhere. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay, are there more questions? Otherwise, you can all join my anthropology group next year and we can continue discussing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well um if that is it then thank you so much for being online um it was really a pleasure to um have this conversation with you and um i really sincerely honestly hope that all of you and your family and friends are really um safe and in good health and that we can all, I mean, the second years, they will be gone, but hopefully I can meet all the first years um, in autumn.